Hi, and welcome back to Weekly Dev Tips. I'm your host, Steve Smith, a.k.a. R. Dallas. This is episode 70 on Defense in Depth with guest Matt Eland. This week's tip is brought to you by devbetter.com. What is DevBetter? It's a private group coaching community geared toward accelerating developer careers. We meet weekly for live Q&A sessions and have an active Discord-based discussion the rest of the week. Topics range from coding skills to interviewing and personal branding. Check out devbetter.com and read some of the testimonials to see if it might be right for you. This week's tip is brought to you by guest Matt Eland. Matt is a teacher, writer, and .NET Foundation member who focuses on software quality and improving code. Welcome, Matt. Thanks, Steve. Uh, so I work with a lot of older systems um, and with some younger teams. And a lot of our code is, it's really important that it calculates things uh, consistently and correctly. Uh, because of this, I spend a lot of time thinking about uh, software quality. Uh, and when you think about quality, a lot of us think about uh, unit tests first and foremost. And I, I think these are certainly a part of the solution, uh, but I don't think that should be where the conversation stops. Uh, so I think that we need to really have a layered approach to software quality, and I like to refer to this as a defense in depth type of strategy. Um, similar to the uh, information security, network security concept, uh, they're both inspired by like the Roman military strategy of the same name. And what I mean by this is, is like a, kind of a layered strategy where no one portion of your defense is supposed to stop everything. Things can get through, and then the second layer and third layers uh, can, can uh, make sure that the defects don't get out into production. So uh, some of the things I like about this is that, you know, it, it takes some of the blame out of everything. Uh, so that you no longer expect one thing, for example, code review, to catch all your defects. In fact, uh, it's likely it's not going to, and there's certain things that will never be caught by code review, for example. But when you layer these things on top of each other, it makes it so that you can catch more things uh, easier, and that if things do get out into production, you know, they're usually less severe, uh, more edge casey, uh, or easier to roll back. So that's that's kind of some of what I'm thinking about with, with this approach. So what kind of quality gates are we talking about here? Uh, I, I think it varies by the organization and the team and the technologies that you're dealing with. Uh, but some of the things that, that I think about are knowledge bases, uh, articles on uh, technology practices, code standards, uh, systems architecture, and really just the products in general. Uh, I think internal mentoring and training is an important aspect, you know, making sure that people understand uh, best practices for the languages and tools that they're using, especially if you're doing some sort of a formal analysis on the types of bugs that do make it to production. Uh, it can be easy to, to stop these things at an educational level. I, I think that uh, grooming tickets as a cross-functional team uh, with product management, quality assurance, uh, development members in the room uh, is an important thing because you can start to look at dependencies, things that maybe aren't being considered. Uh, before work is even started on things. Similarly, I think that we can uh, look at our acceptance criteria as part of that grooming, uh, and uh, things like uh, behavior-driven development or example mapping are, are a little bit of uh, bonus points on top of that um, as far as specifying requirements and uh, acceptance criteria. Um, I, I think that if you encourage a culture where people should can talk to each other you know, outside of meetings and frequently check in. It's like, hey, here's what I'm thinking about as I'm starting to build this feature. What do you think about this architecture? Or, uh, hey, I, I got this question about what this should do. Uh, what, what, uh, what should happen in this edge case? Um, I, I think things like that can help clarify things before they hit the next level. I advocate for working in feature branches whenever you are making changes, um, or fixed branches as the case may be. Uh, it's just safer and it makes it easier to control what gets into which builds uh, and moving things into a further sprint or further release uh, becomes a lot easier if you're working with uh, uh, integration branches and feature branches. Uh, obviously unit tests and test driven development are key, especially to long term strategy um, because a new developer can come in and just run the tests and, and see if they broke something. Um, you don't always have those in place when you're starting, so I think it's important to build up to that. Um, but you can't always purely rely on them, unfortunately. I like to encourage manual testing as well uh, from the developer perspective. Uh, so there's a, a habit that I'm, I'm developing myself on uh, fighting my own confirmation bias that the code I wrote is good, is that I force my spell, myself to spend about 15 minutes trying to break my own code. Uh, and you know, if I, if I can't, then, well, yay, I'll send it on. 
but I'm going to try to find something productive to do in that 15 minutes. So I'm going to try to find something wrong with my code. And often I'll find something that I otherwise wouldn't have. Uh, similarly, when I'm about to make a merge request or when someone on the team is, you know, we encourage them to uh, uh, to review their own changes uh, before submitting that merge request. And, and often they'll catch things like to-dos or things like that. Code review is a big part of creating a quality culture. You're going to, if you get multiple people involved in code review, they're each going to look for different things. Uh, they're going to you know, like you get some junior people in, in the same code review, they're going to learn more about how you did your feature or how the other guys are, are doing the code review. Uh, and, and I think people are gonna, just going to learn more that way. Um, but code review is actually one of those places where you can catch a surprising number of issues before they, they move on to anything more, more like formal testing. Static analysis tools, I like to always have some sort of code analysis running uh, as part of the CI CD pipeline. Uh, so whenever the build runs, uh, the tools being uh, tools being run to uh, just analyze the code for correctness and if we're introducing more technical debt or things are getting better, uh, things like that. And that can actually inform code review uh, when you have the results of that uh, analysis available. Um, similarly, the uh, CI CD pipeline should run your automated tests. Um, obviously, you never want anything to make it to the next step if you have failing tests. <laughs> um, and this kind of forces developers to run those if they weren't running them on their machines. I've tried some interesting practices where developers will write a draft test case and provide it to quality assurance. And then QA will look, take, take that test case and uh, examine it. And they'll have a little bit more of an understanding of what the feature is, what might break as a result of it. And they'll sort of revise and expand and polish it. Uh, and they'll give that feedback to, back to the developer. Like, hey, did you think of this? Did you think of this? And I think as a result, everybody gets better and developers spend more time thinking about quality. Um, which is a win for everybody at the at the cost of a little bit of a, a extra overhead of a developer writing up a paragraph or two for quality assurance. Uh, obviously, QA is a vital part of any sort of quality uh, release strategy, uh, and so you can't leave out quality assurance testing. Uh, product management should always be reviewing things. You should always be you know potentially demoing things in an agile setting as well. Uh, I think that uh, preview or staging environments are important. So prior to a release, you know, put something out in a preview environment or your beta users, uh, give them access to it. I, I think that's a, a good way to get uh, get feedback on new changes or find early issues that maybe only affect a few of your users. Uh, you're certainly not going to uh, find things that affect everybody, uh, but it, it's a good way of reducing your risk. Um, Docker and containerization, um, it, it can be very... It can reduce some of the risk to take the same container and move it between environment and environment and environment. So you're not doing like a separate build per uh, UAT or preview and quality assurance and uh, production, uh, for example. It, so it just reduces the, the degree of change um, in every environment transition, uh, as Dockerization does. Um, Blue-green deployments can help with a little bit, uh, especially if, if something goes horribly wrong, you need to roll back. Um, it's rare, but that can help. Um, and then things like uh, canary testing, you can use uh, feature flags or the uh, scientist library to uh, to sort of test things or, or have a, roll, a good quick rollback strategy uh, at production level uh, for your beta users and things like that. Um, and finally, I like to use exception monitoring solutions like, uh, like Raygun or Rollbar or App Insights or whatever the product you might you want to use is. Um, but I'll have those running in QA and preview environments and obviously production. And then you can kind of see like, hey, well, as soon as we integrated this feature, we had this massive spike in bugs. Okay, well, let's let's take a look at this. What's going on here? Uh, and that could help a lot. Um, it can help you resolve things quickly, do a quick rollback, etc. So um, obviously very long list. I feel like it's incomplete. I think there's still plenty to add to it. Um, but you can kind of start to see how these things form a cohesive strategy to identify defects uh, at each stage of the development pipeline. Uh, and, and you layer these things together and you treat them uh, you know, with respect and, and you're eventually gonna find things before they hit production, um, which is pretty cool. Um, and things will make it past that and that's okay. You're reducing the, the chance of things getting out and they're reducing the severity of the things that are gonna get out. 
And when they do, you can look at it and say, well, how did this get this far? It's not necessarily that, that people weren't doing their jobs. It could be that, you know, certain certain steps are, you know, they don't have much of a shot at detecting this type of a bug. And so maybe you need to uh, add some new process or uh, something like that. And sometimes you just say, okay, this is a one-off. We don't really need to change the way that we're working uh, because everything that you add has a little bit of overhead, a little bit of complexity, a little bit of bureaucracy to it. So you have to sort of do a cost-benefit analysis. But this sort of um, layered strategy, I think, is, is very good for reducing risk to your customers or your end users, uh, whatever the term you might use in your organization for them. If you have any additional things that you think should be on the list, I'd love to hear about them. Uh, you can get in touch with me at matt at killalldefects.com. Um, but always looking for more ideas to improve software quality. It's a subject I'm very passionate about. Uh, thank you for having me, Steve. Thanks, Matt. That's it for this week. If you want to hear more from me, go to rdallas.com slash tips to sign up for a free tip in your inbox every Wednesday. I'm also streaming programming topics on twitch.tv slash rdallas most Fridays at noon Eastern Time and at random other times when I feel like it during this quarantine. Thanks for subscribing to Weekly Dev Tips, and I'll see you next week with another great developer tip.